Okay, thank you. Oops, I'll hold it a little bit like this. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'll be doing a uh, rapid intensive scientific journey of why we're facing a new situation which requires a ramp up of scientific effort to support a transition towards global sustainability. I'd like to start by saying that this presentation stands on the shoulders of the major scientific advancements of global environmental change research coordinated and led by ICSU. So from the World Climate Research Program, the International Human Dimensions Program, the International Geobiosphere Program, Diversitas, and the Earth System Science Partnership. What I'll be doing rapidly here is first of all to convey and summarize the scientific message to the world of a sense of urgency, but also point out that we have a Sisyphusian dilemma. We're making a lot of good progress in different parts of the world, but still the momentum of growth, the momentum of population growth, the momentum of rebound is that we're still moving in the wrong direction. I'll be trying to convince you that there's scientific evidence today for a very dramatic message. Humanity has reached a saturation point in terms of pressures on the planet. But at the same time, there are indications of potentially interesting Copernican revolution with a mind shift in insights in terms of reconnect to the biosphere. I'll be arguing for the need for a new framework for human development in the Anthropocene, which I'll be explaining. And then finally looking at what role can science play in contributing to tipping the world towards sustainability. Now, it all starts, of course, with the insight that we're living on a human-dominated planet. It all starts in terms of Earth system science, believe it or not, with the human dimension. It's the whole demographic pressure, which has two dilemmas in terms of pressure on the planet. It's not only that we're 7 billion people committed to 9 billion people in only 40 years, but it's also that we have an equity dilemma, the 2080 dilemma that so far the negative pressures on the Earth system has predominantly been caused by the rich minority, the 20% of the Earth population that stepped on to the Industrial Revolution in the mid-18th century. Now, the vast majority, the remaining 80%, are moving very rapidly and very positively up the development ladder, but so far adopting more or less unsustainable lifestyles. That's the momentum. The second pressure is, of course, the big challenge of climate change. It has in itself a dilemma which can be encapsulated in three numbers. The first is, of course, the policy interpretation of the IPCC research and the research coming out of ICSU, that 450 ppm concentration of greenhouse gases would be enough to stay under two degrees warming on average. There's very little science to support that notion. In fact, most science indicates that we would have to stabilize at a lower concentration, potentially at 400 carbon dioxide equivalent in, in concentration, to be able to have a reasonable chance to stay under two degrees. The drama is that September 2011, we've reached 450 ppm. We are at a danger point. The International Energy Agency shows that we're rapidly and decisively moving towards 550 ppm and beyond. You would have wished this human disturbance of the energy system to disturb a resilient, strong planet able to cope with this disturbance. But unfortunately, science indicates from the UN Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, from the economics of ecosystem service and biodiversity, and from the great research from diversities and others, that we in fact have a situation where we are losing very rapidly ecosystem functions and services in an unprecedented pace over the last 50 years. Simply put, at a moment in human history on the planet when we need a strong planet to cope with a major, major disturbance of the energy system, the planet is at its weakest point as far as we know for the past 10,000 years. And as if this was not enough, we're starting to learn that our notion that nature behaves in incremental, linear, and predictable ways, and therefore controllable ways, which has guided governance, which has guided economics, which has guided institutions, and even behaviors, is the exception. Most science today indicates from complex systems dynamics research that nature can go for long periods with very limited impacts or change, and then suddenly under trigger, very abruptly change non-linearly, and even make state changes. So surprise seems to be universality. These four pressures together changes entirely the, the cocktail for sustainable development in the world. Now, the drama of this is so important that the Nobel Prize laureate Paul Crutzen proposed a couple of years back that it's so dramatic that we may actually have entered a new geological epoch, the Anthropocene, Anthros for humans, where humanity constitutes a geological force of pressure on planet Earth, equivalent with natural geological forces. 
Now, as if this was not enough, there's increasing insights that the ecological space at the global level is now interacting with the social space, that we're increasingly having to connect the global economy, the financial system, the ecological system, the biosphere and natural resources in an interacting soup, which is playing out in real time. I find it very interesting, but also disturbing, that the very positive developments in the Arab Spring, which is, of course, a movement of a young generation interconnecting and the repressive dictatorships under decades, perhaps came to scale linked to the fact that food prices escalated under an oil price rise combined with droughts and water scarcity, potentially driven by anthropogenic climate change. We're coming to scale at the global level in social ecological interactions. This led, for a couple of months back, a group of Nobel Prize laureates and leading global environment change scientists, some of them in this room, to sign on something called the Stockholm Memorandum, coming out of the third Nobel Laureate Symposium on Global Sustainability, summarizing a message to Ban Ki-moon's high-level panel on global sustainability, the preparatory phase to the Rio conference next year, that in fact science indicates that humanity may have reached a saturation point. And that is very dramatic because it suggests that we are in a zero-sum game, that we have to respect some absolutes in terms of resource use and in terms of ecosystem um, expropriation. And that a resilient biosphere is the basis for human well-being. And it's not only about climate change. It's about this interactive ecosystem climate change challenge. But that there's no science to suggest that a global transition would not be possible and moreover desirable. Now this is exiting the scientific frame and reaching out much, much more broadly. We found it very interesting and encouraging that the economist took on and welcomed humanity to the Anthropocene. This is the Copernican revolution potentially tipping towards a deeper insight that we are at this globalized phase in terms of pressures on the planet. The drama is that, as you know, two years before, The Economist had this front page, which was the vortex when the world was ramping right into the financial crisis. The turbulent world was facing is that these two global dramas are now interacting in real time. Just a couple of months back, research from colleagues working under the ICSU climate programs show statistically that we today cannot exclude that armed conflict are actually linked to variability in the climate system. An example of how the social ecological play space plays out. The post for Climate Impact Research has now started to do scenarios all the way to 2300, so not just looking at 2050, not only looking at 2100, and what we're starting to see in the models that start incorporating feedbacks and non-linear change is that we may have reached this branch point in terms of what is the future for the world. Either we start transitioning now towards a world under two degrees, a safe world that can support nine billion plus people, or we can no longer exclude a self-propelled warming that could actually take us beyond five, six degrees. An average temperature increase we haven't seen in 35 million years. So this is what is at stake, and increasingly we're starting to see very good research, again coming out of the World Climate Research Program, that even the extreme events we're starting to see now, in, in, in the years right now, can no longer be excluded from anthropogenic impact on the global system. This example on intense extreme precipitation events today contributing or being influenced by and amplified by anthropogenic climate change. This is a change. I mean, just a couple of months back, no scientist would dare, when the journalist asked, is this storm, is this drought caused by anthropogenic climate change or global warming, every scientist would say, no, we cannot link individual events with anthropogenic climate change. Now this is changing. It's changing and it's changing now. Now what is the evidence then for this dramatic intro that we may have reached the Anthropocene and that we may be hitting hardwired process at the global level? Well, it comes out of a major, major synthesis from IGBP under ICSU a couple of years back. And I'm now snatching some slides that Sybil Seitzinger and others have brought forward, which of course starts with the classic hockey stick of carbon dioxide increase. This is the only hockey stick we talk about normally. This is since the industrialization 1750 until today. You know the pattern. It has its sister in temperature increase of roughly 0.8 degrees Celsius so far. But when you look at it carefully, essentially every environmental process, every natural resource dimension that matters for economic growth and human well-being looks the same. And I'll just flip you through a couple of the key ones. So here you have anthropogenic concentrations of 
um, N2O coming out of modern agriculture and industrial processes. Here you have methane release, again, from draining wetlands and modern agricultural development. The stratospheric ozone depletion, which is coming and bending in the right direction. Here you have frequency of climatic disasters, overfishing of the world's oceans. Here you have the eutrophication dilemma in our coastal zones and freshwater systems, deforestation, expansion of agricultural land, and finally, perhaps the most dramatic one, we're in the sixth extinction of species on the planet. The first one caused by humans, one of them being the loss of dinosaurs 65 million years ago. So we have this multiple pattern of similar exponential pressures on the planet. All the curves look roughly like this. They bend in the mid-50s. Ten years after the Second World War, we're three billion people. We come to scale in the industrial metabolism, and we start to see global impacts. And these are empirical observations of pressures on the planet. This is a very important point for the whole agenda on sustainability. This is when Rachel Carson published her decisive book, Silent Spring. This is another decisive point. This is when the Club of Rome released its limits to growth report. These were both shot down, as you know, by conventional economists and the kind of predominant paradigm of growth in the world. But is this surprising? Because when you look at it, in the, empir the empirical evidence that they based their warnings were very limited. You couldn't exclude that the curve could go in any direction. Today, we're up here. Today, there's no excuse for an action. In fact, a very important scientific message is that we're the first generation to have the scientific evidence that we are in a new situation in terms of exponential pressures. We also know increasingly from disciplinary science that we must bend these curves very soon. For many areas, even in this decade, not because the world would suddenly topple over and collapse by the 1st of January 2021, but because we may be releasing feedback mechanisms that over the next centuries may be irreversibly pushing us in the wrong direction. So it is, in fact, a very dramatic situation and a very dramatic message coming out of science. Now, how come we've ended up in this situation? Well, there are many ways of telling that story, but one way is through Hans Rosling's very famous gap minder diagram of wealth in the world. This, in my mind, is a story why political leaders are not acting. This is a graph showing the success story of the pressures we've put on the planet so far. On the x-axis here, you see, on average, the number of children born per woman on, in the world. And on the y-axis, you see average life expectancy. You see the world, represented in circles here, countries in the world, are up in the desired corner, with less than two children per woman and a life expectancy above 65 years. We've had an enormous payback of our over-exploitation of the planet. And in dark blue, essentially, you have the poorest countries in Africa and some destabilized um, uh, countries in conflict. So you could argue that the two flip sides of our social ecological challenge has an explanation. But the situation has now changed since the last two, three decades. And now is the time for desired bending. OK. So this is the story about the pressures. Now we need to understand also the risks we face of those pressures. What are the potential impacts? And the impacts are, as I hinted earlier, not that the changes in conditions would only change linearly, as suggested by the upper graph here. In fact, more and more science indicates that thresholds and even hysteresis effects are probably what we have to expect when we put pressure on systems such as the Greenland Ar Greenland Ice Sheet, the Arctic, the Himalayas, the monsoon system, ocean systems, marine systems, etc. The evidence base for this is growing dramatically. These are just a couple of examples of what we see happening in the real world. We often illustrate this threshold behavior of ecosystems in this cup and bowl diagram. The depth of the cup is the ability of the system to remain in a desired state. You give it a, a knock and it rolls in a deep cup. It has resilience. Over many decades, we exploit and use these systems. The cup gets shallow, but the system continues to deliver ecosystem services. It appears to be healthy, but the cup is more and more shallow. And a trigger like a disease or a storm or a flood makes it tipple over, and the feedback mechanism kicks in, which locks it in an entirely new state. Now, this research has generally been done on smaller scale, but now we're starting to see that it's going up in scale. We have our headquarters in Stockholm. The Baltic Sea may be one such inland sea system that may have tipped over a threshold in 1989 due to climate change, eutrophication, overfishing, making the system locked in a eutrophied, slimy, 
algal bloom frequent situation. This curve, which may be one of the most important scientific diagrams, all categories, is, as you all know, the potential tipping point of the Arctic sea ice, the summer sea ice extent, which in 2007 lost 30% in a very dramatic change which science could not predict in gray area here. 2011 will be another record low. And more and more research shows that even the Amazonas or the rainforests in the world may also be sensitive to pressures that may cause a flip from rainforest to savanna. So big systems looking in a non-dynamic way, non-linear way towards rapid change. Now the reason why there's reason for concern is that a tipping point can only occur when there's a feedback, a reinforcing mechanism. And the example from the Arctic is a very pedagogic one because this is how we want to see the Arctic with a high degree of reflectivity of incoming solar radiation, an albedo that reflects incoming solar radiation. When the system melts, it gets darker, and the reinforcing feedback is more radiative energy taken up by the ocean, and the melting may come to a point where it's irreversible. Increasingly, we're starting to understand also that biodiversity matters for these big tipping points. This was a paper coming out just a couple of weeks back showing that apex consumers play a decisive role in the whole stability of ecosystem. You lose the apex consumer, the whole food web changes, and systems may easier get kicked over undesired thresholds. Now this is often not easy to explain, that how on earth can it be that biodiversity plays such a decisive role for the regulation of the Earth system? One way of describing it is to connect it with the rapid urbanization in the world. In New York, for example, if you would suddenly cut off 20% of the population, New York may still function if you just take it right off from an average. But if you take out a certain function, what happens then? If you take out a function such as an apex consumer, I had, by the way, as an anecdote, the opportunity to talk to President Zedillo, or former President Mexico Zedillo, who's now chair of Procter & Gamble. When I came to this point of, of uh, New York, he said, well, I can tell you that if you throw out the Mexicans, New York will collapse. And that was exactly the point. You, you throw out a key function, and the whole system is more sensitive to thresholds. I mean, my idea was, of course, to suggest the police force or, or the fire brigades, but, but he pointed out the, the Mexicans in New York. So this is the whole point why biodiversity is today a global concern. It's a toolbox for strategic change. Science is now increasingly synthesizing the risk for big, big tipping points in the Earth system, and we then finally, two, three years back, asked ourselves the following question. What happens if you combine the pressures of the Anthropocene, the hockey stick patterns, with the insight of the risk of nonlinear change? What happens when you address this combined integrated science? Do we now, for the first time, have to put the planet into the cup? Are we not destabilizing only ecosystems and big biomes? Are we, in fact, at risk of eroding the resilience of the Earth system? And this was what led into the concept that we've called planetary boundaries, which is a concept which is now increasingly not only uh, to say developed within science, but also something which is catching on also in the policy domain, uh, not, not least in the process up until Rio. To answer this question, of course, we have to start by answering the question, what is our desired state for the planet? And it's interesting that science today can probably tell that story very eloquently and robustly. This is, as you know, the, the fantastic work from the ice core data, this is in this case from Antarctica, the longest track from 800,000 years back, showing the oscillations between glacials and interglacials and the narrow span that the planet has stayed in in terms of temperature and carbon dioxide, never above 300 ppm. Again, we are today above this level up at 400. Now, what we did was to take literature data, taking out the last 100,000 years and on the y-axis, you have a proxy for living conditions on the planet, average temperature. At why 100,000 years? Well, it's half the time that we've been full modern humans on the planet. So we've had the same ability to develop civilizations as we know it. Now, we all know that this was a jumpy journey indeed. In fact, 80,000 years back at a low point there was when we exited Africa. And as you know, genetic uh, paleo research showed that we may have been down at 15,000 fertile adult pairs at that point. We come to a point 10,000 years back when we enter the extraordinarily stable Holocene period. We barely enter it and we invent agriculture. We go from being hunters and gatherers, we are 2 to 20 million people on the planet, we invent agriculture and off we go on the civilizational journey we know of. We reach 3 billion people at the Great Acceleration, we're today 7 on our way to 9. 
We define the Holocene as the only state we know that can ethically and responsibly support the world population and the modern economy as we know it. So this gives us a very good reference point. And recent research confirms the stability of the Holocene, even if you take data from Greenland, if you take data from Arctic or Antarctic. So it's an extraordinarily stable phase with a plus minus one degree Celsius oscillation during that whole period. So we're on our way out, that's the Anthropocene. But we took this as our desired state and asked the question to global environmental change scientists, of many of them, if not all of them, within the ICSU family, what are then the Earth system processes we need to be stewards of to remain in the desired Holocene state? That was the first question. And then the second one was, can we identify thresholds that we do not want to occur? And for each such process, can we identify a control variable that we could even quantify the threshold? And because thresholds are very difficult to quantify and they're moving targets, can we take a standard deviation around that from science and position a boundary, a safe boundary, upstream of which we have a safe operating space. And this complements earlier concepts of limits to growth and carrying capacity and guardrails because in the past the tendency was to map out natural resources, to ask ourselves human demands, make assumptions on technology, and as soon as human demands exceeded resource availability, you hit a limit. Here we're just stepping back and saying, what will it take to avoid that we topple over unwanted thresholds in the Earth system to allow human development within a safe playing field. And this was done through a quite meticulous methodology on identifying thresholds and standard deviations and putting on the best known science the boundary position and giving us a safe operating space. And the result is this. We identified, and this is still a scientific journey, nine boundary processes. I won't go through them in detail, but the interesting thing is that, to begin with, it's not only climate. It's not surprising the ozone depletion and ozone acidification, which have evidence of large-scale thresholds, but more surprising, perhaps, is that this group of scientists included land use change, freshwater use, rate of biodiversity loss, and the interference with the big nitrogen and phosphorus cycles, because increasing evidence show that these do regulate the resilience of landscapes and seascapes in terms of keeping stable stability in their system. And then we included also chemical pollution and aerosol loading. And we were able to at least put tentative quantifications on seven of these. And I'll just briefly go through the journey for two of them and then come to a couple of conclusions. What this allows us is to provide a safe operating space for human development in the Anthropocene. You can, for example, do what this diagram shows. In green here, you have the safe operating space that most likely we've transgressed the safe boundaries for biodiversity, climate, and nitrogen. And we're starting to see evidence of this. The Arctic is one. The flips in many, many freshwater systems is another. And the implications of biodiversity loss on the resilience of landscapes, a third example. For biodiversity loss, it's based on the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment and the evidence that we are losing species at 10 to 100 times the natural background rate, and we're projected to reach levels of over 10,000 times the background rate and its implications for ecological functions and services. On climate, it's based very much on the notion of risk analysis, which comes out, for example, of this research, which you may have seen, which is the famous Red Amber's work of Smith and colleagues, showing here the summary of where science was in terms of risk in the third assessment report of the IPCC. And our concern is the column furthest to the right, which is the risk of large-scale discontinuities, the risk of human-induced catastrophes in the climate system. And you see here degrees Celsius on average warming, and that the scientific message at that point, our understanding at that point, was that up at four or five degrees, we could risk large-scale discontinuities. But look at the summary post-fourth assessment. The more we learn about the Earth system and its complexities and feedbacks, the redder the story becomes. The larger the risk, the more vulnerable the system seems. And that the risk for large-scale discontinuities is now down at average three degrees. On the left here, by the way, you have the risk for large-scale tipping points in the world's ecosystems, particularly marine systems. Here you have the warming so far, and here is the so-called safe two-degree threshold, which is unsafe indeed if you listen to science and therefore also not surprising that most developing countries particularly are not very much in favor of that threshold. It's based on the research coming out of aerosol cooling and the 
risk from Ramanathan and others that we may already be committed to over two degrees warming, but it's being cooled by aerosols. It's based on research from Jim Hansen and others that if you take slow feedbacks into account, the sensitivity and forcing may be way beyond what we've seen before. It's looking at the NASA maps on current warming, showing that the last three, four years are among the warmest years on record and that we, particularly in the poles, have reason to be concerned. And all of this leading to an uncertainty zone between 350 and 550 ppm carbon dioxide, and we put the boundary at the safe lower end, applying a precautionary principle on each boundary. Same story for ocean acidification. You may have seen these graphs. I find them astonishing in terms of the pH curve estimates for the world's oceans over the past 25 million years, showing a deep fall, a 30% reduction over the period since the Industrial Revolution, a, a zero uncertainty linked to human emissions of carbon dioxide. As you know, it's not only that the oceans acidify, they also snatch carbonates, which means that the building blocks for all marine life, calcium carbonate in its different forms, calcite and aragonite, also then disappears from marine systems. We have more and more science being able to show and quantify. We took aragonite as the most sensitive of these um, calcium carbonates as an indicator. You could map quite well where we are today and where we're heading, and from that we quantified a threshold base, for example, on this great research which shows the pre-industrial availability of calcium carbonate in form of aragonite in dark green. Not surprisingly, you have the world's coral reefs and dots here. Good access to Lego blocks for building good biodiverse coral reefs. This is the situation today. We're ready today mapping and observing a loss of aragonite, and this is the prediction in 2065 under business as usual. So we went through this for all these nine and, and proposing quantifications. They do interact, of course, and this is the great work from the Global Carbon Project under the Earth System Science Partnership. Here you have the emission of carbon over the past 50 years in gigatons of carbon, from four to nine. And the question is, of course, is it the area under this curve that has led to one, roughly one degree warming so far? And as, of course, you all know, that's not the case. In fact, we have the world's largest free ecosystem service when oceans and land sequester half of our emissions. So the world's oceans and the world's terrestrial ecosystems are behaving exactly according to resilience theory. The Earth tries to remain in the Holocene by helping us and having a negative feedback. The drama is that the increase of sequestration is, is very um, positive from two to four gigatons of carbon. So, so far, the planet is being our best friend in terms of absorbing more and more carbon. But as you may know, the first analysis also coming out of ICSU uh, initiated research shows that the carbon sinks in the world's forests are large but going down due to deforestation. And we see the first examples in red here of decline in carbon sequestration in terrestrial ecosystems. So again, a delicacy in interactions and delicacy in sequestering. And we're also starting to understand that systems interact. Here is what happens if you cut down the world's rainforest in red and having impacts on temperature all the way to Central Asia. So we live in an interconnected planet where the Arctic, the rainforest, do form regulating systems at the planetary scale. So what does all this mean then to close in terms of science role in moving ahead? Well, to begin with, it's just to recognize that we do need bend to bend curves very rapidly. This is just one example that we need essentially to decarbonize the world by 2050 if we bend the emission curve on fossil fuels by 2015 to have a reasonable chance to consider these feedbacks. We are at FAO, and the planetary boundary analysis allows us to put a full new specification on what has to happen with world food production in order to stay within a safe operating space. And it's not only about land, it's about water, it's about quantified specification of agriculture moving from source to sink and its contributions to biodiversity reduction. So we get a new tool to define sustainability criteria in different sectors. Interestingly, we have a fantastic opportunity to do this more actively in the science community by connecting IPCC with the new intergovernmental platform on biodiversity and ecosystem services, which has been very, very strongly promoted and, and ambassadored by Biodiversitas and ICSU. So again, a very large opportunity to be able to influence. And as Dan Livman will be talking very soon, ICSU has responded to this already, drawing a line on the drama, on the urgency, to say now science needs to step up one 
more notch to deliver answers to the big questions that the world needs answered over the next decade in the visioning process and the new initiative on Earth system research for global sustainability. And I'll just offer you four pillars of this research. The first is that now we can start saying that global sustainability is a prerequisite for poverty alleviation. So the global and the local are today interconnected. We cannot attain the Millennium Development Goals without global sustainability. That's a, a strong proposition from science. We now need to predict risks of catastrophic thresholds in the Earth system. We need to be able to deliver that knowledge to society. We need to explore innovative pathways for a grand transformation. It has to happen fast. It has to happen in 196 countries simultaneously. And this has to be promoted to be able to do a transition. And finally, it of course requires planetary stewardship in a way we haven't seen before to allow for human prosperity in the Anthropocene. A small challenge for science. Thank you. Thank you.